Energy you know, prices, let's talk about oil as, as the largest one. They're volatile, right? They go up, they go down, and they're very long cycles. And um, if I talk to some previous lows, uh, late 1973, the real oil price hit $20. Um, and that was a sort of a 50-year window low. 25 years later, in 98, after the Asian crisis, again, the oil price hit $20 US real. Um, at the time, that was the famous economist headline, $5 oil, um, which uh, pretty much to the week predicted the start of the rally. Um, it ended about 150 uh, uh, 12 years later. And now another 12 years later, another 25-year cycle, we're done, we hit, we hit $20 again. In, in, in April. So first thing to say is this is a you know three times an 80 year type low price that we reached in April and in every case there was a reason for that right you know whether, whether you know it was the Asian crisis people thought the Asian growth story was gone this time it's COVID and how we're going to recover and what's the timing and all these sort of and, 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 and all these sort of issues so it is a very it's a very low price now low prices are not a good reason to buy energy stocks right far from it <laughs> Um, however, what usually happens is that the prices of the stocks uh, get marked down very heavily as well. And this is where the, uh, you know, attraction, that's where the attraction lies. Um, because um, from, usually from those sort of starting points, you have ended up doing very well because the price eventually goes up. And the way we value these stocks is that we know that we can't forecast oil prices. Nobody can in the world, right? Um, so we take the approach that um, in the short term, we just use the spot and then on the futures curve, and then we have a mean reversion to what we think is the long run sustainable price, which drives is sort of 45 to $50 and has been for a very long time. And you get that information from the cost curves, right? So, um, you know, 12 years ago uh, in, in mid-08, energy was 10% weight in our, in our index because the oil price was $150. We had zero. To us, at those sort of prices, oil was just full of risk. So we were enormously underweight. And um, we first you know, took an active position after that big drop in 14, 15, when prices became reasonable, and it was a small overweight. Now, given what has happened, because it just quickly halved again, now we have a very significant overweight in our, in our select fund. And um, so from a very big picture perspective, this is one in 25 year thing. If you're not long now, uh, you'll probably never be long, right? because prices have really got, uh, 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 got crunched. So there is a lot of pain, let me, let, let me tell you, out there. Uh, in the US, for example, you know, something like 60% of bankruptcies are, are energy plays at the moment. Um, the rig count, you know, uh, drilling rigs in the US, is at the lowest level since the 1940s. So this is an absolute crunch. And um, there are a couple of things that, uh, so far I've sort of spoken about this as if, you know, everything is the same as always. Things are always different. And there are a couple of facts I want to talk about very quickly. One of them, of course, is um, we need a lot of fossil fuel use. So in the future, demand growth is going to be less. International Energy Agency says you know, about 1% for the next five years. Um, but it's very important to realise there that the natural decline rate of oil wells and oil fields around the world is about 5 to 7% per annum. And that's really important. Because if demand rolls over and becomes very flat or even goes negative eventually, and I, uh, I suspect it will, um, uh, what really matters is does naturally supply drop off faster than that or slower than that? If it dropped off slower than that, you would get a permanent glut and permanently low prices. But this sector needs hundreds of billions of dollars of investment even to get eventually minus 1% growth rates because the natural runoff rate is quite high. So in other words, um, the thing that usually restores balance, which is underinvestment and curtailment of production, still works even if the growth rate is now no longer 2% but 1% or even zero. Second factor that's different is US shale. US shale um, you know, uh, has runoff natural decline rates of 20 to 30%. So they in the US, they invested a vast amount of money in drilling in the US and it's awful business because you, they never made any cash flow. So the market liked it because it had strong production growth rates, but it's an awful business. And Australians know this well because you'll recall that PHP bought Petrohawk for 40 billion and pretty much wrote off 30 billion of that before they sold it. Terrible business. The good thing for the energy sector in the cycle is this runs off really fast. 
and with you know rig counts in the US at, at you know as I say um, what is it 80 or low, it's going to run off quite fast. So there's 10, 11 percent of global production that's really going to crunch, which helps. Um, the last thing is that we don't actually have any oil exposures because we invest in Australia, and as you know, we don't have much oil here. So we have two exposures. One is to Woodside uh, uh, and gas, and Whitehaven and coal. So let me quick briefly talk about um, you know b uh, uh, both of those. The third disruptive force, if you will, or change from what's usual, is electric vehicles. So electric vehicles, um, it will take quite a while to change the world's fleets over to electric. Let's say it happens in 30 years. That will subtract 1% from oil demand per annum. Ends up 30% lower than it would have been just for simple land transport fuel. It increases uh, electricity demand by 20%. That's the other side of the equation. You need electricity. Um, so in the sense that if you are in uh, energy production fuels, it's a positive, or any sort of mode of energy production uh, for, 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 for electricity. If you are in transport, in oil, it's bad news. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, the world is moving from a system where 9,500% oh, was base load power to uh, a target uh, you know, by sort of 40, of having 40% renewable, 60% base load, and then they want to go beyond that and eventually squeeze the traditional base load out. In Southeast Asia, um, things are quite different because energy, uh, electricity use is very low. So they will immediately go to this new model. They will never go through the you know, all base load in the same way they've never had fixed lines, they went directly to mobile. But because the um, base of, uh, of demand growth is so great, even at 50%, you need a lot of additional base load generation. And a lot of these countries don't have hydro opportunities, they don't have nuclear industries, they need um, gas, coal, whatever. So um, again, the International Energy Agency says that in ASEAN countries, which is going on 700 million people, um, demand for, the, for, for gas and coal will double in the next 10 years on. So Pacific Basin has very different uh, dynamics to the Atlantic. In Atlantic, coal is in terminal decline. In our region, it is quite different because you know 80% of the world's energy growth these days comes from comes from our region. In our region, the average power station has an, has a life of 12 years. In Europe, it's 40. In the US, it's 42 years. They're all ready to be pensioned off, right? Um, very different dynamics. So let me talk quickly about those two stocks. Um, Woodside, everybody knows about. It's a very low cost, um, very good balance sheet uh, uh, producer of of LNG, which they sell to Asia. Um, and there's a very simple sort of calculation you can do, which is to ask yourself, how much does the market pay for a barrel of production by Woodside? And we looked at this for the last 23 years, and on average the market pays about $340 for a barrel of production. And if you think about the numbers, it makes rough sense in the sense that the oil price might average $50, their break-even cost is only $10, so they're a very low cost producer, but you know, you've got tax and on cost and so forth. Let's call it $30 of profit per barrel. Um, the market on average paid $340, so it's about 11 times. Right? All makes sense. In '98, that low point I spoke about, you know, when, when, when the oil price uh, hit its low 25 years ago, the market only paid $175, half. As a consequence, for the next 10 years, the stock was up six or seven fold. Now, there was a boom in there as well, but it even did well before the oil price did well because the price that people were paying per, dollar, uh, per you know, a, a barrel of production, a barrel of oil equivalent, was very low. Today, it's less than that. You can today buy that under $166. And by the way, at the peak, it was $630. If, you know, something like 21 times, really bad idea. Uh, today, you're buying this at the lowest price, a barrel of production at the lowest price in 23 years. That's a pretty good starting point. You don't need a lot to go right to double your money. If you get another boom, as we did in the, from the last starting point, you're going to make six, seven times. But we're not counting on that. We're just counting on the, on the, on the, on the mean reversion. And then, there's, and then there's Whitehaven, which is a uh, thermal producer, very high, very high quality, very high energy content, very low impurities uh, to Japan for the, for the ultra-critical you know, ultra type of um, plants that they have there. 
and Korea and, and, and Taiwan, those sort of places. And 30% is in fact a PCI coking, so lower end coking. Um, again, in that sector, prices are really low. We are at the position where about half the curve loses money. Um, uh, Whitehaven is sort of in the middle of the curve, so they're sort of break even, but half the curve loses money. And in the Atlantic Basin, seaborne exports are down 40%, and in our basin, about 30%. So supply response is hitting. People are just shutting off their production. We've seen the announcements by Glencore and the like, because you don't want to run your mine at a loss. So, you know, the actions are there to, 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 to equilibrate that market, but a 50th percentile price doesn't last, right? 50th percentile price is where half the curve loses money. You get shutdowns at the high, the high cost end relatively quickly. So um, it's a bit of a special, if you will, it's, it's high risk, high return sort of proposition. But let me just mention for you um, something about the price. 2017, 2019, those three years, they were good years. Um, if you take look, you look, look at the average earnings in those years, the, the company is currently on 1.8 times earnings. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you got back to 2017, 2019, um, they would earn their entire share price in something like 20 months. So um, it has fallen a lot, pretty painful, but it is now at a price where it is, it is a very skewed option. Right? It's a sort of stock that can double and triple. Um, and even then it will be done half from what it was. So um, a bit of a special that one, um, but you can see that you don't need many good years to, to earn your money. And I should say, when we value this, you know, we use a much higher discount rate because it's coal. We say that um, really all the resource stays in the ground. They, they never develop. That's just standard. And we cut off our DCF, you know, eventually and say, look, this coal is a business, even in Asia, that has a, has a lifespan. But at, you know, as I say, you know, um, that sort of multiple, less than two times, um, you don't need many good years and you, you make a lot of money. So, so that's the, in brief, is our, is our energy summary. I should note that the last time we had the combination of a real oil price and a depressed energy sector and a tech boom was, of course, early 2000. Um, the US energy sector out outperformed the NASDAQ, no, no less, by 650% over the following eight years. So there was an enormous relative shift there um, because the starting point was extreme, and I think starting point on both sides, energy and tech, is pretty extreme today. <laughs>